Welcome again. For those of you who have turned, tuned in a little bit late, my name is Nai Swami Jaya, and I welcome you to this evening's satsang on Living Wisely, Living Well. As you know, every week we read a selection appropriate for the day from this book by Swami Kriyananda, Living Wisely, Living Well, and I'd like to read you today's reading. True happiness is not the fruit of years of painful struggle and anxiety. It is a long succession, rather, of little decisions simply to be happy in the moment. As my guru said, the minutes are more important than the years. When I was a boy, there was a common story that was told in school it was told to young children, and I believe it was written by Hans Christian Andersen, but it's a fairy tale. And in this story, it's a story of a prince. And the prince wanted to find a princess with whom he could be married. And finally, a, a princess uh, appeared, and a marriage was, a, was arranged. But before the marriage was to take place, the queen, the prince's mother, wanted to make sure that this was truly a princess, not some uh, make-believe princess that she really was, uh, what she said she was and what uh, was advertised, you might say. So it, she devised a test for the princess. And what uh, the test was is the princess came to the uh, castle and uh, the kingdom and uh, was invited to stay the night. And so before the princess went to bed, the queen went into the bedroom. And what the queen did is she unmade the bed and she put into the bed a very small pea, a pulse, into the bed. She then covered it over with 20 mattresses. Mm -hmm. And then the princess was invited to spend the night and she slept in the bed. Well, the next morning, the next morning, the queen uh, at breakfast time uh, asked the princess, says, how did you sleep last night? And the princess said, oh, it was terrible. It was terrible. I slept very poorly. Uh, I'm black and blue and bruised all over because uh, it was so, there was so rough. There must have been something in the bed. And the queen was very pleased because she knew that the princess must be a true princess because of the... Uh, uh, she had been obviously raised in luxury to the point where she would uh, notice that pea and had often slept in, usually slept in a very comfortable bed. Well, this story, The Princess and the Pea, has come down to represent not only literally the story itself, but also it's come to represent the attitude that often people have toward life. In other words, in order for to be happy in life, have you ever noticed how some people, they have to get everything just right. This is, oh, there's one thing wrong and they fix that. Here's another thing wrong and they fix that until finally everything has to be just right. Nah, now I'm comfortable, now I'm happy. But we know sooner or later there's this little, little something is going to disturb their happiness. It's too hot, it's too cold, it's too noisy, it's, oh, it's too quiet. Whatever it might be, they're always trying to adjust circumstances. And this story has come to represent such a person who's never happy. There's always finding something that's going to disturb their happiness. And this is symbolic, this story of one of the great delusions that we encounter in life. It's a great delusion to think that circumstances are, if they're perfect circumstances, will determine our perfect happiness. We can be happy only when things outside of ourselves are just so. And it's this delusion that we must overcome because it's false. I'll, we begin to realize with a little bit of experience in life that this life is a world of relativity. It's never going to be perfect. There's always going to be something, as the saying goes, there's always going to be a little fly in the ointment or a little, some little something to disturb us. I remember Swami Kriyananda once uh, saying a story about from his life. He said when uh, 
he had at a certain point in his life had uh, had his horoscope uh, cast and his horoscope apparently uh, had uh, indicated a life of tremendous difficulty. He said everything from a, one point of view was wrong. It was that he, whoop, let me, I drop the microphone. Okay. Uh, everything in his life was wrong. There was uh, crosses and uh, things that indicated he was going to have difficulties in life. And uh, he commented to the person, perhaps it was the person who made the horoscope, or perhaps it was to a friend that uh, he was talking to this, you know, to about this. He said, well, I don't know. My life hasn't been so bad, hasn't been so difficult. So he was, uh, he was uh, questioning the accuracy of the horoscope. And the, and the friend or the other person said, what do you mean? He said, and started recounting all of the difficulties that Kriyananda had gone through in his life and all the difficulties that he had encountered in his life. And then Swami thought about it and says, well, I guess I have had a few difficulties. But he didn't see it that way necessarily. He didn't think of his life as, oh my gosh, I've got, I've got, my horoscope says that I'm going to encounter this bad luck and this obstacle. He didn't see it that way at all. He saw them. You might say, in retrospect, he saw them as opportunities. Opportunities to overcome challenges or opportunities for growth. Swamiji often also in later years told of another story that was very similar to this. In his life uh, in the late 1950s, early 1960s, he had been posted as part of his organization, Self-Realization Fellowship, in uh, India, and he came to know Anandamoy Ma, and a great saint, many of you know of. And Anandamoy Ma was uh, attracted to Swami spirituality, and so when they met, she often encouraged him to come and sit with her and to be at the satsangs and so on, and always welcomed him when he came to the ashram. Well, at one visit, Swami came to, uh, came to Anandamoy Ma and he had heard of difficulties that Anandamoy Ma was having in her own life. Health difficulties, challenges, tra she's traveled uh, constantly from one ashram to another and things were uh, blocking her progress and, and there were things in the terms of the relationships of some of the devotees around her. It was a little bit, she was going through a period where outwardly you look at it, it was a difficult circumstance. And so Swamiji very naturally, because he felt great love for Nandamoy Ma, very sympathetically was commiserating with her, saying, oh, I'm so sorry to hear that this has happened or that has happened. And Nandamoy Ma didn't say anything. She just looked at him very dispassionately and said, is that how you see it? And Swami stopped and he realized, obviously that sense of I'm suffering or I'm having a difficult time was not how Nandamoy Ma saw it. She said, it's in a, the implication being how we choose to see what happens to us in our life is up to us. Is it difficult? Is it joyful? Is it easy? All of these things are but, you might say, movies on the passing screen of life. I have a friend I've known for some years, and she has had challenges in her life. And I'm sad to say that her life has been one of constant struggle. Now, Outwardly, you could just she doesn't necessarily see that as struggle, have to see that as struggle. But as long as I've known her, I would have to say, sadly, that I don't think she's ever been happy. It's always when I, I'm somewhat afraid to write to her now and email, how are things going? And I'll receive back a very long email uh, listing all the troubles and tribulations and why life has been mistreating her in one way or another. And Years ago, when this would happen, I would try to offer suggestions. Well, you might try this and you might try that. Why don't you do this? And I began to see, really, it, it did no good. 
In some deep sense, I came to realize that she had chosen to suffer. Now, we all go through pain in life. Pain is inevitable function of the body. We go through difficulties and, and sometimes they are painful. But pain and suffering are not necessarily the same thing. Suffering is how we react to the pains of life. Jesus Christ, I'm sure, uh, I'm sure uh, that experience of being on the cross was very painful, but did he suffer? Suffer in the sense of you and I. I'm sure he suffered for the ignorance of people, but in terms of the suffering that would, as we perceive it, I don't believe that was, that was so. Great masters enjoy and transcend suffering. And so this is an illustration that this is something that we choose. We have this ability if we so use it. There's a very nice story that I've repeated many times of the learn I learned from Swami Kriyananda also. He spoke of the great saint Rabia. Rabia is was a Sufi saint, a, a woman saint. Uh, I believe in uh, Persia in those days, many centuries ago, and she was at that period of her life where she was aged and her body was suffering and she was in bed and disciples came to her and one of the disciples said, Ah, oh, Mother, uh, one is no true lover of God who is not willing to suffer for God. And she just looked at him. I, I think of Ananda Ma when I say this. Is, is, is that how you see it? But Rabia said to this gentleman, this disciple, she said, that's to me smacks of ego. And another disciple said, said uh, in his place, he said, well, how about one is no true lover of God unless one is happy to suffer for God's sake. And she said, no, no, that too is not enough. Something more is needed. And they said, well, mother, you tell us, what is a true lover of God? And she says, a true lover of God is one who forgets his suffering in the contemplation of the Divine Beloved. And this is what we aspire to. The true lover of God is one who forgets the difficulties, forgets the tests. And I mentioned this earlier, uh, in, as a few moments ago, I was speaking about happiness. Well, a person can't find happiness because of this trial, this test, this difficulty and oh how life is treating me. Well the same for happiness, this same message applies to God as well. In the devotee who seeks God, you often hear, well, if I get this aspect of my life just right, if I get that aspect of my life just right, then I'll be able to find God. Then I'll be able to to meditate. Then I'll be able to do my spiritual practices. If my outer life is arranged in such a way to allow me to do that. So you find people who say, well, I, it, not the time to find God now. I have, you know, I have family. I have responsibilities. I have business. When I get all of that arranged, then maybe later in life, then I'll have time to find God. But it usually doesn't happen. It usually doesn't happen. We have to take the time now. Now is the time to find God. Now is the time, if we want to put it a little bit more simply, now is the time to be happy. And so we look at, the, we look at what Swamiji wrote, and I read it again. True happiness, it's a long succession of little decisions simply to be happy in the moment. This is what we aim for, is to make that, make that choice to be happy right now. And, and if we expand that, to find God right now. This is why Master said, Yogananda said, the minutes are more important than the years, because it's in the minutes of what we do right now that determines what will happen in the years. This applies also, if we think about it, many people 
we teach meditation and people have a difficulty, they, they say, well, I can't meditate. I, I doesn't seem to be able to uh, gain the results of meditation of what I want. My spiritual life is dry. If that's, a ca if that's the case, the same applies for that. Uh, you can't uh, succumb to that delusion that if I, everything is just right, in other words, if my seat is perfectly comfortable, there's no pee underneath the seat, the, the cushion. If my, if I have just the right beads, if I have just the now, I've uh, I've I've uh, energized myself and I'm exercised. Now I can sit to meditate and receive that joy of God. If you approach it that way, you're not going. To, obviously, we want to use common sense, but you're not going to find just by that alone what you're looking for. And people apply this to the spiritual path in terms of techniques as well. They say if I learn just this technique, if I learn that technique, if I have if I have uh, this secret uh, or that secret uh, revealed to me, then I'll be able to uh, find God. And people have come to Kriya with that attitude, if I just do the right technique, the secret technique, then I'll be able to find God. But we can't approach it that way. We have to bring to our meditation that which we want to receive. Let's say joy. We want to bring joy to our meditation and then we will begin to receive it. A friend of mine in India told me a story of uh, Swami Satchitananda, a disciple, wonderful disciple of Swami Shivananda. And Swami Satchitananda uh, he, from India, he traveled to America and he had an ashram, he's passed now, but he had an ashram on the east coast of America. And this one disciple uh, was always one, he felt that Swami, Kriyan, uh, Swami Satchitananda was not giving him the true deepest teachings, that there was always something more that could be revealed to him, that he was withholding from him, that, and that perhaps he was giving to the other long-time disciples, but wasn't giving to him. Now, logically, he, he didn't think this was true, but there was something in his heart that was just there, that yes, there's something more that will be revealed to me when the time is right, and then I'll be able to find God. But until such time, I'm a little bit, uh, I, I, I'm uh, lacking. And so one day, Swami, they were meditating at the ashram, and there were not many people there, and they were in the uh, temple room, meditating, meditation room, and Swami Satchitananda was presiding. And for some reason on that day, uh, one by one, disciples began to leave. And he was sitting there, Swami Satchitananda, who was leading meditation, was sitting on the dais, also there. And one by one, everybody was leaving, but he continued to sit until finally only the disciple and the guru were left in the room. And the disciple looked around and thought, oh, this is a special moment. And then very slowly, Swami Satchitananda began to rise and looked at the disciple. And the disciple had this thought in his mind, oh, today is the day where he's going to give me that deeper teaching. And Swami Satchitananda rose from, his, from the dais and began to approach very slowly and calmly, come up to the disciple to tell him something. And the disciple saw this and became very excited. And Swami Satchitananda finally came up to the disciple leaned down and whispered to him, take it easy, and backed up and walked out. <laughs> I always thought that was, that was a good story, and I hope that the disciple learned something. I suspect it was so, because he told that story. But the, that, that he had this delusion that he didn't have what he needed at that moment in order to find God. Yet all of us do. In this very moment, right now, we have everything we need.
to find God. Paramahansa Yogananda used to say to his disciples, people cry, when will I find God? When will I find God? And the master would say, they don't realize you have him right now. You have him right now. If we but look within ourselves, we have everything we need, except we don't have perhaps that love for God, that joy for God, that is the essential criteria for us to be able to receive those blessings. Because what that which we bring to our meditation is that which we will receive. That which we bring to God is that which, will, which we will receive back. There's another story you probably heard. I believe this one is from Tagore. Tagore told of the story of the, of the king who would ride his chariot in his chariot about the kingdom and visiting the various parts of the kingdom. And one day he came to, uh, toward a village and there was a villager there in the kingdom and he's, the villager saw the king coming and was very, very excited when the king up started to approach with his entourage. And the king came and he stopped at that villager's home, got out of his chariot and he came to the villager and the villager was expecting the king to perhaps give him a boon or somehow to bless him in some material way, give him something special. But the king comes up to the villager and, and asks the villager, what is it that you can offer to me? And the villager was very surprised. He thought, oh, the king, instead of giving me something, the king is asking me to give him something. So the villager caught off guard. He went into the house and he found something. And he came back and he gave the king one grain of rice. Now the king was very appreciative, took the grain of rice respectfully, got into his chariot and rode off. Now the villager was thinking, you know, he was a little bit disgruntled, of course, by this, uh, the king did not offer him anything. And then, and matter of fact, not only did he not offer, he took something from him, asked for something. What sort of king was that? Well, that night, he went to bed. So went and laid on his, on his bed, and the next morning, he woke up, and he found by his head, by the pillow there by his head, he found one grain of golden a rice that was made out of gold next to him. And he thought, oh, if I had only had the courage to give the king everything, what would have been my return? And this is where we stand before God. God asks us not what he's going to give us. This is how we often approach God. We approach God, we approach the Guru, we approach the spiritual life of what can I get out of this? What can, how is it going to benefit me? And I have the practical value that often I've given classes and people want to know, how is meditation going to help me? How is the spiritual life going to help me? And naturally, we, ask, we answer on that level. But for the deeper devotee, somebody who has a little bit more experience on, in this and understands the true relationship that we are developing with the divine, if we would take that approach of what is it, not what God can do for me, not what meditation can do for me, not what the world can do for me, but what can I offer back to the world? This is the attitude of the devotee, and we find that if we have that courage, like that villager, we summon up that courage to give ourselves totally to God, give ourselves totally to Guru. If we serve, if we offer ourselves, then we find that the reward, in some subtle way, a roundabout way, because it seems like the divine always comes in the back door, not the front, in some subtle way, our reward inwardly is tenfold, a hundredfold of what we put out. And this is the secret of meditation. So if you want to meditate, if your meditation isn't going perhaps as you would like, love. Meditate with joy. Meditate with enthusiasm. Meditate with peace. And you'll find that
that peace, joy, love, all of these things that our, our heart is seeking will be returned to us because this is our nature. We have to express that nature and in that nature of expression of that nature then we find that it's multiplied and this is what we're all looking for. Often I have reflected that so much of what we see in life, just like I mentioned my friend, she, she has been very unhappy, life reflects back to us that which we perceive and put out. The energy that we put forth, it's a mirror. And this uh, often has been an image that has been used for the Guru. The Guru is uh, one of his uh, master's disciples said it was like a flawless mirror reflecting back to us not always what we were at that moment but reflecting back to us our potential also and so you see that life as we see life joy sadness uh, uh, upsets tests trials accomplishments Often it's but a reflection, and I go back to that uh, question that Ananda Moima asked Swami Kriyananda. Is that how you see it? So I think each of us, let's look within ourselves. How is it? What is it? What are we seeing in life? Is that how we see it? Are we seeing joy? Are we seeing grace, God's work? Uh, manifest in our lives and we should practice this don't let this just be philosophy as we walk out in the day we go about our day tomorrow when you get up in the morning try to see in the little things around you in life in the experiences see God there be like uh, 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 Ram Prashad you know Divine Mother everywhere he saw every little thing was an expression of Divine Mother or it's like uh, uh, Swami Ram Das who who in wandering about India from one spot to another as God so chose for his life, he saw everything. He saw Ram, 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 or Divine Mother, whatever it might be. But this is not something we wait for to happen to us. We don't wait for that state to come to us. We have to practice that. And so tomorrow when we go about our day, look at the little incidences in your life. See God there. Bring joy. Try to see in that joy, uh, place joy in that, and you'll find that joy begins to be reflected back to you. Many blessings to all of you, and I hope you have a joyous week ahead.